With the introduction to ethics out of the way, what we're going to turn now to is to look at how we can judge ethics. And the first set of things we're going to look at are ethical actions. So uh, why don't we jump into that right away? For the next couple of weeks, we're going to deal with three kinds of ethical theories. The first one, this video, is going to be dealing with a consequentialist ethics. We're going to deal with egoism and utilitarianism, and they focus on the outcome. So we judge whether something's ethical based upon the outcome. After that, we'll do a different video for deontological ethics for this week. And that's not focusing on the outcome. Rather, it's focused on what we do on our actions and whether they're rationally ethical. In particular, we're going to look at the work of uh, Immanuel Kant and his work around ethics. And then next week, we'll get to have a look at virtue ethics, which is a third approach to deciding whether something's ethical or not. So these three ethical theories give us three different ways of looking and deciding whether an act is good or bad. So probably the most basic consequentialist uh, ethical framework is ethical egoism. All ethical egoism really means is that what is ethical is what furthers your individual best interests. And that's it. Um, if it doesn't further your best interests, then it's not ethical. If it does, it is. And you'll notice that this is a consequentialist theory because we're looking at the outcome about whether you're made better off or not as a result of the action that you take. Perhaps one of the most well-known theories, and, and probably the most well-known consequentialist theory, is utilitarianism. So utilitarianism takes ethical egoism, but it expands the set of who is made better off. So the basic idea is we decide what is ethical based upon the total good or the total happiness, or in economics terms, the total utility for all the parties involved when that's maximized. That's what's ethical. So again, focus. notice here we're focused on the outcome, right? What maximizes that utility for all of the people in, involved? Uh, Bentham and Mill were, were well-known um, uh, uh, moral philosophers who um, expanded this approach. And the key elements of the, pro of the approach are that it looks at the good of everyone, not just um, the individual who's doing the act, which would, of course, be ethical egoism. And so an ethical act is one where we create the greatest good. And that is the greatest amount of pleasure or happiness overall, the best balance of happiness over unhappiness for everyone, for all the stakeholders. While some philosophers have extended and modified classical utilitarianism, um, we're going to concentrate on the classical approach here, which is about maximizing that happiness or good. And we take happiness or good to actually be pleasure or the reduction of pain. The fundamental way to approach a utilitarian analysis is to identify all the people who are affected, all of the stakeholders, then calculate for each of them the happiness or unhappiness of the act, and then we add all that up to work out the act that maximizes that number. So you do get to take your own happiness into account, but you also have to account for every other affected person's happiness. So no one has a special privilege uh, in terms of their happiness in this decision. It's all weighted equally. Of course, although some people might have more or less happiness with an act, but again, the key criteria is that we maximize the total happiness for everyone affected by the act. So Vaughan here has set out a way to approach that. So you get it, you get the action, you determine the total amount of happiness or the net happiness, right? So all net means is the positives uh, and the negatives, and then you add them together to get our net happiness. Repeat that for everyone who's involved, sum up all their happiness, and then the action with the best, and I'm going to go the best total score, the overall net happiness is the one that we should be carrying out. Just to emphasize it, it's the total amount of happiness, not the maximum number of people who are made happy. So let's look at our example here where we've got Anne, Ben, Chris, Dan, and Ellie. 
And they have three options, three possible behaviours, right? The one with the greatest net happiness is option three, right? Even though Dan and Ellie are made worse off, Anne and Ben are made so much better off that that outweighs the negative to Dan and Ellie. So utilitarianism is would suggest to us in its classical form that the ethical act is option three. It does raise the question, though, is that a just outcome where, where some people are made worse off, where in, when in other decisions they might not have been? Hmm. We'll come to that in week three. Now, I just want to stress this point because sometimes um, it can be hard um, for us to think this way. But by its very nature, if we follow utilitarianism, the ethical act is option two. It is actually unethical to do options one or two. Okay, so the, that's the definition of what is ethical. It's not like a reason to do it or whatever. It is actually the fact that it is. it would be the way of classifying whether something's ethical or not. So very clearly in that previous option, uh, in that previous example, option three is the ethical one. Options one and two are unethical under a classical utilitarian uh, analysis. So why don't you have a look at this particular table? Which option is the most moral or which is the ethical action taking a utilitarian analysis? Hopefully you can see that very clearly it's option one. That wasn't too hard. How do I know that? I don't even need to look at this part of the table. I just go to the total utility table, 100. That's the one. It beats 90 and 30, so it's got to be action one. I'm not even looking at what is in these particular uh, calculations at the individual level. And I'm not worried about how many people are affected. I'm only worried about this total number. You can probably guess that not everyone follows a total utilitarianist approach. It's a very calculative way, and it's only got that one criteria of, of maximising um, total happiness. So there are criticisms of the approach. Let's have a look at them now. The first one is, can we physically actually get all of the information? Can we actually identify all of the stakeholders that are, uh, that are affected? And even if we did that, could we really evaluate all of the consequences? I mean, we actually have to come up with a number for the happiness for everyone. How, how do we do that with some of these um, ethical acts that we deal with? It's a very practical problem that we then need to get some common way to evaluate these harms and benefits, right? Can we really add up the chance of, uh, say, death as against the chance of, uh, as against the pleasure of, uh, say, drinking a soft drink. I mean, can we really compare those? Um, some people would argue, yes, that's what we have insurance for, and uh, we pay premiums, and we do put calculations on this. Others would, would argue that they're qualitatively different and would therefore be criticising a utilitarianist approach. One of the most striking challenges to a strict utilitarianist approach involves minority groups. For instance, if we had, uh, if we had a rule if, or if we were going to make a decision, because we're not making rules, it's about consequences here. If we were going to make a decision that made a small group worse off, but made uh, most people better off, would we do it? Utilitarianists would, be, would say yes. And that kind of logic can lead to something like, say, slavery being considered ethical under the particular framework. And finally, it doesn't really worry about what the intentions of the party are. So it really doesn't matter what you thought or wanted. It totally only th cares about the consequences of the action. And some would argue that that misses a key component of what it means to actually be ethical. So hopefully that's given you uh, enough material to go on now and be able to do some application because it's only in the application that A, 
you're going to get ready to do the assessment, but B, that we start to see some of the difficulties with these approaches, but also the benefits and how they actually work. So I'd really encourage you to get into some of those problems that we've got.